Hey gang, it's been an interesting day. Um, beautiful outside, a bit windy. Um, maybe not the best day to rake leaves like I chose to do. It was sort of comical if you could have seen it. Uh, but I hope you got to enjoy a little bit of the outdoors and that you're still doing well. I thought I would uh, do another broadcast this evening of a Bible study, and you can, uh, of course, take advantage of that anytime that you that you wish. Uh, but it's been an interesting day for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's been sort of fascinating for me to see all of my uh, colleagues in preaching, uh, friends and people that I don't know as well, uh, learning how to use this technology of broadcasting, either on Facebook or Zoom or Loom or whatever kind of uh, medium they're using. We were all learning how to do that here out of necessity. And there have been some great lessons that I've got to see. Maybe you've, you've seen several from different uh, preachers as well uh, as I have. I even saw one this morning, a young guy that I got to work with a few years back he did some youth ministry with us and lives in another part of the country now. But he was actually standing on a, a lake or a pond, standing on a boat out in the water and preached a message to the camera. Not sure how they filmed that, but man, it was really good. He had a great lesson and it was sort of a fascinating setting. But uh, we're very adaptable creatures, I guess. and. And uh, it's been interesting seeing how we've adapted to our current situation. Uh, but again, we're, we're looking forward to when we can get back to a little bit of normalcy, right? Um, but anyway, uh, this evening I want to uh, ask you to turn with me to the book of First Chronicles. Uh, again, a book maybe that we don't open very often. Uh, but there's a story there that I thought might be a good study for us tonight, not necessarily related to our current situation. Uh, so many of our lessons and, and things have been based on that now, but this is a little bit different. Although uh, there is a currency to it because uh, you may well realize that this is census year and our, uh, our government wants to count, count us. And so you've perhaps received mail either through uh, postal service or, or maybe email asking you to fill out your census information. And that's uh, not just a modern thing, but it's an ancient thing. So you'll remember that um, about the time that Jesus was born, there was a census taking place in the world. And then uh, even more ancient than that, if we go back into the Old Testament period, um, there was a census that, that, that Moses took um, and, um, and the one that we're going to talk about in this message as well. So uh, these are ancient things and um, we're still putting up with them now, just in a little bit different way. Uh, I've been told back through the years several times, either by teachers or parents or maybe coaches, Mark, act like you had some sense. And maybe that's something that you've been told as well. Uh, I had done something or said something that was senseless, and I was reminded of it promptly. Uh, we, we all do that at times. We act like we have no sense. And people in Scripture, of course, even great people, heroes, did that as well. And sometimes the consequences for them were quite steep, including what we're going to look at now. Did you realize that there was a time when God almost totally destroyed his people? And I'm not talking about the flood in the days of Noah. I'm talking about a time during the days of King David when an angel of the Lord stood above Jerusalem the Bible says, with a flaming sword in his hand, ready to strike down David and everybody else who lived there. One of the reasons that, that we ought to love and appreciate the Bible 
And one of the reasons we can trust it is that it's so honest. It is, uh, even about its greatest heroes, what we would call its greatest heroes, we get the full story. And uh, we get the good and the bad of all these people. And David, of course, is one of the Bible's heroes. As we said in another message recently, he he's known as a man after God's own heart. Uh, Jesus himself is referred to as the son of David. But David had major problems, as we know, and he sinned grievously on more than one occasion. And these are recorded for us. Uh, you would think if the Bible was just a, a doc document of propaganda that such stories wouldn't be included, but they are. And, and we're referring here to more than just the terrible thing that happened with Bathsheba. Um, and I want us to look here at one of these incidents tonight. It's in, again, 1 Chronicles chapter 21. If you take time to read 1 Chronicles up to this point, um, there's a telling of many of the reasons that David was a great hero in Israel. The story is told of how he became king, how he won battle after battle. He was a great warrior. We, we realize and, and learn that he became an incredible leader in so many ways. But there was also times that he let God down. And, and there was this time when he really hurt the people of Israel by his action. And this recorded for us again in 21st chapter of 1 Chronicles. And I just want to read the first seven verses of that chapter. It begins in an interesting way. It says, Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, Go, number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, and bring me a report that I may know their number. But Joab said, May the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. Are they not, my lord the king, all of them, my lord's servants? Why then should my lord require this? Why should it be a cause of guilt for Israel? But the king's word prevailed against Joab. So Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came back to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to David. In all Israel, there were 1,100,000 men who drew the sword. And in Judah, 470,000 who drew the sword. But he did not include Levi and Benjamin in the numbering, for the king's command was abhorrent to Joab. But God was displeased with this thing, and he struck Israel. This was, uh, again, one of David's senseless moments, the time that he took a census, an ill-advised census. A senseless census, if you can say that. Now, as we look at this, I think we realize that this wasn't some snap decision out of the clear blue that David made. This was something that had been building in him for a while, for, I imagine, a long time. And, and the final expression of the sin was this census of Israel that he took. And as a result of this, God almost wiped the people out completely. It all begins here in the first verse, 1 Chronicles 21. Who's behind all this? Well, it's interesting that Satan is named. Um, you know that Satan is only explicitly mentioned a handful of times in the Old Testament. Um, he's mentioned in Genesis chapter 3. You remember the serpent tempts Adam and Eve toward the first sin. Then he's mentioned in the book of Job as he accuses Job before God, and he plays that chess match with, with God over Job. 
And then he's mentioned a couple of other places. And, and then right here in 1 Chronicles 21, where it says, Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. Now, did Satan just one day whisper this idea in David's ear? I don't think that's, I don't think that's what happened. He's been working on him. He's been working on the king for some time. Events had built toward this great sin that David would commit. And you read the chapters leading up to this one in 1 Chronicles, and again, you see this great listing of all the exploits of David, uh, all his victories, all his mighty soldiers, how his kingdom was growing by leaps and bounds, mostly at the point of a sword, frankly. And Satan took all those successes that David had and used them against David in this particular incident. Uh, the Bible reveals a lot of things that Satan does to entice people to sin. You know, he tempts them. He tries to uh, take captive their will. Um, he tries to hinder us in our work, our work for God. He will harass us. Uh, in one place, Scripture describes it as sifting. He sifts us. He tries to get us to blaspheme. He tries to trick us. He tries to blind us. And then here in 1 Chronicles 21, we see another thing that Satan tries to do to people, and that is to provoke or incite us to do something. You see, it's not just that he, he tries to get us to quit doing good things. Sometimes he tries to get us to do something that's not right, to do something wrong. He provokes us to sin. And that's what he did to David in this particular case over a period of time, I believe. How did he do it? And, and what was this terrible sin? I mean, how could a census, calling for a census, be a sin? Uh, after all, there, there are other times where God calls for his people to be counted. He calls for a census. Um, one time they're at Mount Sinai, and God told Moses to count the people, to number the people. Um, we've got an entire book in the Bible called Numbers, which records the results of that census in part. Well, what's the problem here? There are some clues in the text. If you look again at verse 5 that we read, um, let's, let's just hear that again. It says, And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to David. In all Israel there were 1,100,000 men who drew the sword, and in Judah 470,000 men who drew the sword. Now notice a couple of things in, in that verse, in, in its details. First, notice who it is that's given the responsibility of doing the census, of actually doing the counting. It's Joab. Who's Joab? Well, Joab is the commander of the army. That's important. Second, Notice who it is that's counted. The text says that Joab counted men who drew the sword. They counted, in other words, the men who were able to fight in battle. And as far as we know, that's all they counted. Now remember, again, who David is. David's the guy who took on the giant Goliath. He took on the armies of the Philistines with just a sling and a few small stones when he was a little boy. David is the guy who has lived by faith his whole life. Um, he's a poet, a singer. He's the sweet psalmist of Israel. He's the guy who wrote this in, in Psalm 20, verse 7. Um, think of this verse in light of what we're studying uh, this evening. 
Psalm 20, verse 7, David wrote, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. But when we read this here in 1 Chronicles, it sure sounds like David is beginning to trust in military might, doesn't it? David and the nation of Israel had been lulled into trusting in their own strength and their own military prowess. And they've been lulled into that way of thinking by Satan. And as a final blow, Satan provokes David to reveal this sinful attitude, the sinful heart, by taking this census and counting the warriors in the nation. Now, David had forgotten some important things. See, when all you have is a slingshot and a few small stones and you're going up against a giant... You know without a doubt you need God, right? But what if you have a million-man army ready to die for you? You might tend to forget God and your need for Him. Well, I think that's what happens here. But David is about to be reminded of God in a mighty way. God sends a pestilence, whatever it was, on Israel. And just like that, David lost 70,000 of those soldiers that he was trusting in. And God also sent his destroying angel to the city of Jerusalem to wipe it out. The city of David, about to be annihilated, and only at the last minute, is that disaster averted? If you read on from where we read the rest of chapter 21, uh, you get the rest of those details of what happens. David and Israel had grown overconfident. They had begun to, begun to forget God as their power. They had perhaps grown overaggressive ready to start a new war campaign without God's blessing. But God puts a stop to that. And he does so real fast and with incredible power. Now I think Satan will tempt us today in a similar way. When we have success, when we have victories, whatever they might be, uh, when we begin to wallow in God's blessings, it's all too easy for us to, to begin to rely on ourselves and forget about God. And, and our world encourages this. You know, in, in the business world, in the world of politics, even sports, who is the one that is most praised and most admired? in those realms in our world. It's the one who gets ahead. It's the one who perhaps is most popular, the one who is most aggressive, most confident. And it can really come to us too. It can come into the church um, in God's kingdom. You know, we're tempted to think as a church, look at all we've done. Uh, look at the people who come. Uh, look at our good works. And, and we're tempted to, to think that our plans and our strategies and the way we do things is the, is the reason that we have success. We need to remember that any success we have comes from the hand of God. Every good gift comes from Him. It's, it's not something we achieve. It's His blessing to us. And so, in all things, he gets the praise. He gets the honor. He gets the glory. And not you, not me, not even us. Our job is to glorify God. 
David's senseless census showed that he was trusting in his own strength, trusting in his own ability, especially in his million-man army. And he would learn. He would learn uh, the, the lesson of Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. It says there, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understand and knows me that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. You might remember Paul writing in the New Testament um, that the only thing he would boast in was his own weakness and the cross of Jesus Christ, because that's where the power is. Now, when we get this lesson as an individual, when we get this lesson as a church, it opens us up once again to the incredible blessings of God. And when we ignore it, and when we go our own way, you know, God might not send a pestilence on us. He might not send an avenging angel with a flaming sword. Uh, but he might with, withhold his blessing. And, and we might well suffer from that. If you think about the time that the church was its strongest, when was that? In the history of the church, the church was its strongest in its greatest days of numerical weakness. When it was persecuted when it was in danger of being exterminated. And it was at its greatest at that time because it trusted God most at that time. And it was later, after the time of the New Testament, when it fell into the darkness of apostasy as it converted emperors and actually began to claim emperors, leaders of the empire, as its leaders and the church began to gain worldly power, that's when it fell. Think of the early days of our own movement, the restoration movement in America. In those early days, it was just a, a few faithful people uh, with a vision and, and just a scattering of small churches, but it really became the most influential movement of its time. Where are we now? Well, the answer to that depends a lot on whether or not we have heeded the lesson of David here, the lesson that David learned as told here in 1 Chronicles 21. Let's keep that in mind individually, and as, as a church body, so we can really experience and, and enjoy the full blessing of God in our work. Thank you for listening tonight. Hope this is a challenge uh, to you and uh, something that will build your faith in coming days. Hope you have a great week and that God will continue to give us opportunities to serve him in whatever form they come and that we'll take them. May God bless your family.